And then we're going to continue integrating rational functions. We wrote down our three base integrals, our two, um, I have these backwards. I just realized that I normally write these with constants over linear, then constant over the x squared plus a squared. And then third, I do the x over x squared. And I decided, oh, I'm going to switch the order up. And I decided that yesterday. And apparently the programming hasn't took yet. So I had those backwards at the beginning. All right. So today we're going to look at integrating rational functions. We had our three um base model rational functions to deal with we have a constant over a linear x minus a degree zero over degree one we have degree one over degree two and degree zero over degree two and the degree two has is quadratic with complex zero so that left the three open questions if there's an x term in the q of x then we'll complete the square. That's our algebraic answer to that question. If the degree of P is greater than or equal to the degree of Q, that's when we're going to use long division to rewrite our improper fraction as a mixed number. And then the third one we have to deal with is if the degree of the denominator is greater than or equal to two and Q of X has real zeros, then what do we do? The algebraic answer is partial fraction decomposition. That's an algebraic thing that you typically don't learn about until you get into calculus. I guess what was happening was we were teaching people partial fraction decomposition in algebra class. By the time they got to calculus, everybody had forgotten it. And so we had to do it over again. So we're like, well, let's just skip that part of algebra and just do that in calculus. So here we are. All right. Completing the square is the one that we'll most often remember uh, because that's useful in solving quadratic equations. If you don't, if you think you don't complete the square when you're solving quadratic equations, because you use the quadratic formula, you just use the shortcut to completing the square. So you are completing the square. You're just doing it in the lazy way. That's worse for your understanding of math. Quadratic formula is trash is what I'm saying. But today we want to focus on the second one. What if the degree of the numerator is greater than or equal to the degree of the denominator? So we talked a little bit about how long division works yesterday. So here's the situation where the degree of the numerator is greater than or equal to that of the denominator. This does not fit my degree zero over degree two or degree one over degree two. So this says we're going to use the, the algebra. Algebra says let's use long division to rewrite this. So I need to do division x squared plus one goes into x squared. If we think about the question from long division, if instead of using the phrase, how much does the denominator go into the first digit of the numerator? Instead of it phrasing it that way, think about division in terms of subtraction. So if I have, let's say, um, an improper fraction that says three into uh, 74. 
the first thing we do is we usually say the truncated phrase, the phrase that doesn't reveal anything about anything. How many times does three go into seven? That's a terrible question. That's not what we're trying to ask. Or that's actually what we're trying to ask. I mean, seriously, if we knew that, we would just write it. Also, when I look at this seven, that seven is not seven. That seven is 70. So if we think about division, we know that three goes into seven two times. We know that that's the phrase that we usually say. Well, what we're asking is, what we're trying to figure out ultimately is how many times we can subtract three from 74 without going negative. That's the, que the big question. The reason we write two is we just do this in groups. This two up here says we can subtract 20 threes from 74 without going negative. That's what we mean when we write the two up there. We can subtract three from 74 at least 20 times. The next step in the multiplication, uh, uh, in the division, long division process is to multiply the two times three and get six. But we're not multiplying two times three and getting six. We're multiplying 20 times 30 and getting 60. So two times three, 20 times 30 is 60. That's the 23s we are subtracting. Seventy-four minus sixty. That's subtracting twenty threes. Is fourteen. And then we just ask the next question: How many threes can we subtract from fourteen without going negative? And we can do that four times. So when we say four times three is twelve. We look at the 14 and we think we could subtract four threes from 14 without going negative. 14 minus 12 is uh, two. And we call that the remainder because we can no longer subtract threes without going negative. So the two is a remainder because we can no longer subtract threes without going negative. And so our answer is 24 and two thirds. When we write the mixed number 24 and two thirds, we are just saying add those two things together. It's just the next, it's the, the fraction just represents the next digit. The two represents two twenties, the four represents four ones, and then plus two thirds. So you wanna think of 24 and two thirds as 24 and two thirds. We don't write the plus, but we should think it, especially because we want to adapt this process to polynomials. So when we look at the polynomial side of things, the first step is how many times can I subtract x squared from x squared, uh, x squared plus one from x squared without going negative? So what I wanna do is I need to multiply the x squared so that these x squareds will cancel out. So I say I can subtract x squared from x squared one time.
we can subtract x squared plus one from x squared one time. So we do that. We do one times x squared plus one is x squared plus one. And then we subtract this from x squared. The x squared minus x squared is zero. And the zero minus one is negative one. Now, if I start subtracting x squared from a one, I have to start putting fractions up here in my quotient. And we're not trying to do that. So we say this is the remainder, negative one is the remainder. So we rewrite our integral as the integral, uh, so x squared, to finish this thought down here, x squared over x squared plus one equals one minus one over x squared plus one. Those two functions will give us the same. So I can replace x squared over x squared plus one with one minus one over x squared plus one. And these are terms that I do know how to integrate. Kind of did a I used up the space that I needed over here. So I need to put a warp in. Questions? The problem that we had with this, this rational function was the degree of the numerator was greater than or equal to that of the denominator. So we used long division to rewrite our integrand into one of the three that we already know, plus a polynomial. That's the mixed number part. So this x squared over x squared plus one is like saying 74 over three. One minus one over x squared plus one is like saying 24 and two thirds. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, so I understand the one minus one over x squared plus one. But when you're doing the division, I thought of it like x squared plus one is bigger than x squared. Because well, we're not looking at the values. Um, we're not looking at the values. X squared plus one is greater in value. The degree of the numerator is two. The degree of the denominator is two. Good question. So here's another example of a rational function where the degree of the numerator is greater than that of the denominator. So that's going to make us do long division. So 
the thinking is going to be, how many times can I subtract x squared from x cubed? Now, if I want to subtract these, I have to make them like terms. So I can subtract x squared from x cubed x times. Oh, I need more space. Uh, the x times x squared is x cubed. x times plus 16 is plus 16x. And now we're, oops, x cubed, spelled cubed wrong. So I want to subtract x squared from x cubed. That means I have to multiply by x. But then I can't just multiply the x squared by x. I have to multiply the x by the 16 because distributive property. But now we subtract. The x cubes cancel just like we planned. If those first two terms don't cancel, then or those first terms don't cancel, then, then, then you have messed up. Something went wrong. And then we take no x minus a 16x is minus 16x. And I can no longer subtract x squared from x without writing fractions. So we're done. That's our remainder. So our thinking was one way we said, when we say it in numbers, we think, how many times can we subtract? We subtract x squared from x cubed x times. We can also think of this as we have to multiply by x so that we can subtract the x squared from x cubed. That is, we need to multiply by x to get like terms so that we can do subtract. This negative 16x is the remainder because now to subtract um, x squared, I'd have to start multiplying by fractions. So in this case, the degree of the remainder is now less than the degree of the denominator. So that means it's the remainder. So I write x cubed over x squared plus 16 as the integral of x minus 16x over x squared plus 16. The integral of x, that's the whole number part. The polynomial is a 1 half x squared. And then we have an x over an x squared, degree 1 over degree 2. So that's going to make a natural law. We can do a substitution on this. There's going to be a 1 half times a 16 is 8. questions? If you have a rational function, you do long division, the, the degree of the remainder is supposed to end up being less than the degree of the denominator. So that's how you know when you've got, when you've arrived at the remainder, no more subtraction. Suppose if you keep going, you can find the power series representation. But that's for later. Any questions?
take a moment and add these fractions. There's no problem. This is just adding fractions. We got to get a common denominator because when we add, we only add things that are the same, and when we add them, it doesn't change what they are. In fractions, sameness is denominator. So we only add fractions with the same denominator. So we have to do our favorite math trick, multiply by one to get a common denominator. So the first fraction gets multiplied by x plus one over x plus one. The second fraction gets multiplied by x minus three over x minus three. So this might be relevant to say integrating this function. First, we notice this is not substitution. We need to start developing, we need to have that instinct for looking at an integral and saying, nope, not substitution. Now, integrating this rational function, no, nah, no, nah, I don't know. I, don't, I can't see anything. Unless I rewrite this, ra this rational function as the sum of these two rational functions, because these two are easy to integrate. So that's our strategy. We want to, instead of write having 7x minus 1 over x squared minus 2x minus 3, I would rather integrate this sum, 5 over x minus 3 plus 2 over x plus 1 to x. I would rather integrate that because now it's just a sum of two of our basic integrals for rational functions, constant over degree 1, degree 0 over degree 1. So I'm just gonna have five copies of the natural log of the absolute value of x minus three, plus two copies of the natural log of the absolute value of x plus one, plus our constant of integration. So the process in our rational function, just add these, that's just addition. So going from the sum, uh, at just getting the sum, that's just addition. But we can see in this example that it would be helpful to look at seven X minus one over X squared minus two X minus three as five over X minus three plus two over x plus one, because then it makes it easy to integrate. That's how we're going to be integrating this. So the process of undoing this, uh, this addition is partial fraction decomposition.
So what we would notice in our integral, 7x minus 1 over x squared minus 2x minus 3, that would make us think about doing partial fraction decomposition is that we would notice that x squared minus 2x minus 3 is degree 2, but it has real zeros. That's what's making us think we need to do a partial fraction decomposition. The denominator has real zeros. The denominator has real zeros. That's why we're going to do partial fraction decomposition. The denominator has real zeros. This would be x squared minus something instead of x squared plus something. Now, if you don't recognize this as being factorable right away, we might just see an x term and react to that. Who knows? Crazy things go on in the human mind. We might look at x squared minus 2x minus 3, and we know that there's a distinction between quadratic with complex zeros and quadratic with real zeros. So if we complete the square on this, we'll see that it it's factorable. We'll see what the zeros are. If we look at x squared minus 2x minus 3, if I look at the x squared and the 2x together, then what I need is a plus one to complete the square. So I need to take a plus one off of that minus three. You could also think of it this way. Just leave the minus three and balance the negative of the plus one with a negative one. So X minus one squared minus four since it's something squared minus four, that means it was factorable. Now, this is not wasted effort because now at least we can see what the factors are. One plus or minus, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, one. Can I factor this right? Yeah, one plus or minus two. So we see this, like, oh, look, this, is, this has real zeros. I was thinking it had complex zeros. I wasn't sure. So I completed the square. Oh, I have real zeros. And we can see what the real zeros are. We put this equal to zero. X minus one squared is equal to four. So X minus one is plus or minus two. So X is one plus or minus two. Those are our two real zeros. One plus two. 3, so x minus 3 is a factor. 1 minus 2 is negative 1, so x plus 1 is a factor. Now, before you start thinking, this is a lot of writing to come to this conclusion, this is not writing. All this stuff over here, this is taking place in your mind using your powers of observation. Hopefully, we have enough algebra training to recognize x squared minus 2x minus 3 as factorable. The reason that we want to not say we should do partial fraction decomposition if the denominator is factorable is that the, the definition of factorable that we need is not the definition of factorable that we have. x squared minus 2x minus three is factorable over the integers. I can write it as a product of integers, uh, sorry, a product of polynomials 
with integer coefficients. That's our rational coefficients. But that's our usual definition of factorable. X squared minus 2x minus 5 is not factorable over the rational numbers, but it is factorable over the real numbers. So we don't want to use the language factorable because that's the algebra way of thinking about it when we're just trying to learn how to factor polynomials over the rational numbers. Any questions? Just to clarify. Just to clarify, since I'm not sure what algebraic tradition you came from, but if I had the pro, uh, x squared minus 2x minus 5, it's not about whether this is factorable or not. There aren't any rational factors of 5 whose sum, or sorry, negative 5 whose sum is negative 2. But there are real factors, and we can get there by completing the square. So if we're solving, x minus one squared is equal to a positive six. So x minus one is plus or minus the square root of six. So x is one plus or minus the square root of six. x squared minus two x minus five does not have rational zeros, but it does have real zeros. X squared minus 2x minus 5 is not factorable over the rational numbers. It is factorable over the real numbers. x squared minus, minus 2x minus 5 does not have rational zeros. It's not factorable, so it's not factorable over rational numbers. It does have real zeros. And so it's factorable. over the real numbers. So the, so the zeros are one plus or minus the square root of six. So I could factor it as x minus one plus the square root of six times x minus one minus the square root of six. Once we have the zeros of a polynomial, it's easy to write the factor. We would probably write this as x minus one minus the square root of six and x minus one plus the square root of six. Any questions? Now, if I take this parabola, x squared minus two x minus five, and I move it up right now. Um, right now, it's low enough that I have 
two real zeros. If I raise this parabola up to x squared, So if I shift the parabola up six units, then I'll be looking at x squared minus two x plus one. Note that when I shift that parabola up six units, I move the vertex onto the x-axis. Because x squared minus two x plus one is a square. And it's like x minus one squared plus zero. So x equals one and one. Those are the two solutions. One is in the middle. That six represents how far off we were from putting our vertex onto the x-axis. If I shift, the, continue to shift this parabola up more units, That is, I take x squared minus 2x plus 1, and I shift it up nine more units. We can see that we're not going to have any real zeros. Because the x squared minus 2x plus 1 is x minus 1 squared plus 9. So when we set this equal to zero, x minus one squared is equal to negative nine. So x minus one is plus or minus three i. The square root of nine is three. The square root of negative one is i. So we got x minus one is equal to one, uh, plus or minus three i. So x is one plus or minus three i. Look at the form of all of our quadratics. We have a middle plus or minus some amount. How's everybody okay? Last thing, x squared minus two x plus 10 is not factorable, has, does not have real zeros. So it's not factorable over the real numbers. x squared minus two x plus 10 has complex zeros, so it is factorable over the complex numbers. So when we say factorable, we have to include over what set. All right, so that's gonna do it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.